first, you'll get started. Go ahead. Because. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it's my pleasure to introduce Sam Kotler. He's a contract scientist at the National Center for Advancing Translational Science at the NIH. Um, at NCATS, work, Sam works as an NMR spectroscopist, developing automated NMR methodologies um, towards developing medicinal chemistry and drug, drug discovery methodology. Prior to working at the NIH, Sam attained Jeff, you are disconnected. We cannot hear you. I think so. Jeff, are you there? Uh oh. That was, uh... All right. All right. Maybe. Okay, let me get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly webinar on proteinopathy, and thanks for joining this morning. So today we have actually two speakers, very young researchers like Dr. Samuel Kotler from NCATS National Institute of Health, and we have another speaker, Dr. Anup Anuragi uh, from University of Michigan. Uh, so Dr. Samuel Kotler is working as a research uh, scientist at National Institute of Health, and he is mostly using NMR. And just now I came to know that he is developing a automatic method uh, to screen like the fragment-based drug designing. Uh, uh, in, the, in the past, he worked as a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, he did his PhD from University of Michigan and he worked with Professor Ramamurthy's lab, uh, doing excellent research in storing amyloid aggregation. And I think after that, he moved to, uh, uh, he moved and studied the Huntington uh, disease uh, 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 in the Marius Clore uh, lab. And I think today maybe he is going to talk about that today. So with that short discussion, uh, introduction, I would like to uh, request Sam to take over. So Sam, the floor is all yours, please go ahead. Great, uh, thank you very much. Um, let's share my slides. Everybody can see my slides now, yeah? Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. It's um, it's a really wonderful uh, Zoominar, um, very Ramsian uh, terminology. He, I'm sure he was very excited about the, not calling it a webinar, but calling it a Zoominar. Um, but uh, today, uh, as, as Bikash said, I'll, I'll be discussing my work in the Mary's Clore Lab, where I studied um, the uh, oligomerization events of Huntington fragments using uh, NMR spectroscopy. Um, so, <sighs> To get into a background, I mean, this, this group is very familiar with, with amyloid-related diseases, um, and there are a subset of, of amyloid-related diseases called CAG repeat diseases or poly-Q diseases. Um, and in these diseases, you have a, a single mutation that results in the expansion of a polyglutamine tract. Um, so examples of, of nine proteins on the right here, um, where you have normal length polyglutamine sequences in these proteins, However, an expansion uh, or a mutation that results in expansion of these um, polyglutamines um, causes these proteins to um, uh, aggregate into amyloid um, and cause uh, uh, disease states. Um, and the most known and the most well studied of these, of these diseases is Huntington's disease. Um, and that is because it is the most prevalent um, of these and the uh, protein associated with the disease uh, or that is mutated um, is called Huntington. Um, and it is, uh, so Huntington's is a progressive neurological disorder. Um, and uh, the, it's the exon one um, portion of the Huntington protein that is either proteol proteolytically cleaved um, or there's RNA splicing that results in the um, formation of these exon one fragments. Um, and the Huntington uh, exon 1 is broken down into this amphipathic and terminal sequence in green here, the polyglutamine track, and this poly uh, polyproline-rich um, track that you see here. And normal lengths of the polyglutamine track span anywhere from 6 to 35 glutamines. Um, but once you go above 35, this is the threshold for uh, pathogenic lengths of this polyglutamine track. 
And uh, as I said, it's, it's a progressive neurological disorder. So um, here, so the longer this polyglutamine tract is, um, the more rapid the onset uh, of, of the development of that disease is. And so this uh, panel, the lower left-hand screen here, um, is um, uh, normalized to, to account for uh, the, that difference in, in onset. Um, but you can see the symptoms and function, the functional, functional abilities over time um, and the symptoms over time, um, uh, you can see that they are forming. Um, and the uh, interesting facet of this here in the center panel is that um, if you look at a, a, a normal brain compared to a prodromal Huntington disease brain, that is a pre-symptomatic um, Huntington disease brain, you can already see um, uh, neurodegeneration going on um, in the brains of these individuals. Um, and of course, the hallmark uh, uh, of this disease, as with any amyloid-related disease, is the formation of these amyloid plaques that you, that you see here. In this case, uh, intranuclear inclusions um, in Huntington's disease. Now, the, the, the pathogenic cellular mechanisms in Huntington's disease are varied, um, so it's, it's truly unknown what the, what the cause of the, of the disease is. Um, but it's been associated with various aggregation states of the Huntington uh, protein. That is anything from the monomeric state to some type of oligomeric state um, or you know, the inclusion bodies themselves. All of these have been associated with some type of pathogenic cellular mechanism. Um, and I won't discuss um, very much of that at all today, um, but rather I will focus on the, the amyloid problem um, as at least as I view it, and as much of the community views it, is, is this uh, uh, problem right here that you, that you see is that we start from some um, monomeric protein. Um, in the case of Huntington's, it's a disordered um, uh, monomeric species of the Huntington fragment, exon one fragment, um, that self-associates, um, takes on either transient structure or very uh, well-structured oligomeric species. These oligomeric species um, have a wide variety of, of different morphologies um, that results in some type of fibular structure. Um, and I will focus today on the early aggregation states um, because solution NMR is really um, well suited to um, studying um, these early aggregation events. Um, and this, these disordered oligomers have followed me from my graduate work to my postdoctoral work um, and, and uh, but the goal is to fill in these, these question marks here um, as a community um, to uh, really nail down um, why this process happens and how it happens. Um, and Patrick Vanderwell gave a very nice seminar a couple of weeks ago, so I, I will only briefly touch on the, the, the uh, sort of the gross architecture uh, of amyloid fibrils. Um, and uh, Ralph Langen and, and Ansgar Simmer have also done a, a really wonderful work um, studying amyloid fiber morphology. Um, and uh, the, uh, the architecture of this is that you have the N-terminal sequence um, forming a, an alpha helical structure. The, the beta sheet um, uh, fibrils are, are formed via the uh, uh, polyglutamine tract. Um, and then you have the polyproline rich domain, which forms very dynamic uh, PP2 helices or, or random coil structures. Um, and uh, various morphologies exist um, for these fibers, um, as with uh, many uh, amyloid structures. Um, but I will focus today on, on the aggregation pathway and aggregation mechanisms. Um, and in the case of, of polyglutamine sequences in general, um, uh, you know, a, a polyglutamine sequence on its own will aggregate. Um, however, flanking sequences will influence how um, or the, the, the rate at which um, the poly-Q sequences aggregate into those, those fibular structures here. So uh, this, this first panel that you see in the top center of the screen, um, this is uh, an example from Ron Wetzel's group at University of Pittsburgh, um, demonstrating that uh, the, the length of the poly-Q repeat, um, uh, the, the longer the poly-Q repeat you have, the faster um, it aggregates here. So what this assay is, is demonstrating, it's an HPLC sedimentation assay where they quantify by HPLC the amount of monomer that remains um, over time. And you can see as you increase the length of the polyglutamine sequence, um, the more rapid um, the aggregation occurs. 
And, and down here at the bottom, this wouldn't be an amyloid talk if we didn't have an, a, a THT fluorescence um, time course uh, plot here. So this is work from Judith Friedman's group um, where uh, they show how um, different flanking, uh, this is a nice example rather, uh, many have demonstrated this, um, of, of how the flanking sequences modulate um, the aggregation of, of the Huntington and or poly Q track. So if you look at the, the black curve here, um, the, uh, this is a full exon one with 51 glutamines. You can see it, it, it aggregates very rapidly into the, the THT fluorescent positive um, beta sheet fibrils. Um, however, as soon as you remove the, these, this end terminal sequence, um, it begins to, uh, uh, that, that uh, aggregation rate is, is, is slowed. Um, however, if you remove the polyproline rich domain, that, that aggregation speed uh, ramps up. Um, so there's something to this end terminal sequence that uh, clearly uh, accelerates uh, the aggregation properties of a, of a polyglutamine sequence. Um, and so we'll really focus on that element of the Huntington protein here. Now there, in, in terms of um, dissecting mechanisms of, of this, this aggregation pathways, particularly as it pertains to the, the end terminal sequence, um, there have been, there's been a lot of work um, from groups, as I said, like Ron Wetzel's group, um, Ralph Longin and Angar Simmer's group have done a number of work among others, um, including Rohit Papu's group, um, where they've uh, dissected um, a number of different possibilities of, of how um, Huntington might aggregate um, and different morphologies of intermediate aggregates to those, those fibrillar aggregates. And so I'll, I'll, I'll focus on, on that today, um, particularly using um, solution state NMR uh, and, and answering the question on how solution state NMR can provide insight into um, Huntington aggregation. Um, and so uh, just, you know, very, uh, at a very surface level, NMR is sensitive to structural transitions um, in proteins via the chemical shift. So if you have a disordered monomer that converts into um, some type of structured species, whether it be structured monomer or structured oligomer, uh, we will see modulation in our NMR signal um, as a result of that. Simultaneously, um, we are sensitive to um, binding events um, in, in our NMR spectra. Um, and so if we see binding um, or self-association, um, we will observe modulation in our NMR uh, spectra again. Um, and because we are uh, measuring this uh, on a nucleus in the, in the molecule, we can do these measurements with atomic resolution and in turn with um, residue specificity. So to briefly and grossly go over um, and grossly simplify um, an NMR spectrum, um, uh, the, I'll discuss various parameters that will be important for us to know here today. And that is, um, you know, remembering that the intensity and or peak area uh, of our NMR signal corresponds to a concentration or population um, for that relative, uh, for that particular molecule um, in our sample. Um, and then the other important parameter is this R2 relaxation rate. And this is the peak width and, and gives us information on how mobile um, the protein is. Um, and finally, um, the chemical shift. Um, this provides uh, local structural information um, about our, our molecule of interest. Um, now, however, um, let's consider a scenario where our molecule is now in interconverting between states A and B. Now, this manifests um, in, in different ways depending on the exchange rate or lifetime um, of this process in our NMR spectrum. So here's an example of the sort of the, the time scale um, uh, that NMR uh, is accessible to. Um, and so on the slower end in terms of the NMR time scale around one second, um, this interconversion for a lifetime of about one second, um, this interconversion uh, between these two, two states will result in two visible um, NMR spectra depending you know, on the population of, of both of those species. Now, as you gradually increase the exchange rate, um, you, you will ultimately get to a point um, where if your population of state B is low enough, it will become invisible in your NMR spectrum. Um, so now this is not necessarily problematic um, for an NMR spectroscopist. That is because we can use um, the visible state um, to inform us of the invisible state. And we do that by performing measurements on the visible state by modulating first its R2 relaxation rate. 
And so we fire radio frequency waves that modulate the peak width of our NMR spectrum. Um, and, we, and we plot the R2 as a function of that radio frequency field. And when we do that, um, th this uh, curve becomes, uh, uh, we can fit this curve to a set of equations um, that are a function of the microscopic uh, rate constants, the populations of these species, um, and uh, critically, the uh, difference in chemical shift between those two states. So by obtaining the difference in chemical shifts of states A and B, um, we can get structural information um, of the invisible state in our NMR spectrum. The other important parameter that will be necessary for today's talk is an exchange-induced chemical shift. So on the time scale that we're, we're discussing today, um, if there is interconversion between you know, multiple species, uh, mul uh, visible species, and uh, you know, one or multiple invisible species, uh, we will see slight deviations from the intrinsic chemical shift of our uh, visible, in this case, monomeric state. Um, and we, if we do this as a function of concentration, again, we can fit these data to the same set of parameters and the same equations that govern um, this uh, relaxation dispersion experiment um, uh, and again, obtain additional information um, and additional restraints to fit um, these data. And so because of the limitations uh, of solution state NMR, that is the molecular weight limitations on, on solution state NMR and, and the necessity to have a steady state equilibrium condition this required us to identify or find an optimal uh, uh, sequence for our Huntington protein um, that, uh, you know, that we could observe exchange, um, but not observe rapid um, aggregation here. So these are the constructs that, that we developed initially um, here, um, ranging from no glutamines all the way up to, to 14 glutamines. Um, we did not include initially um, the polyproline rich domain. Um, and what we found was that this, this seven glutamine construct here was the, the, basically the bread and butter. Um, so you see here, if I look at the NMR intensity um, as a function of time, it would appear that there's, uh, so looking at the NMR intensity of the monomer as a function of time, um, so you see this seven glutamine construct doesn't appear to, to aggregate or convert into a larger species. Um, is if you add three glutamines, you see this depletion of, of, of monomeric signal into some type of um, fibular or oligomeric species. Um, and 14 is, is just much too fast for um, any, anything uh, to use these types of methodologies to, to study um, this, this Q14 um, uh, construct. But um, interestingly, if you go up to high enough concentrations um, and wait long enough on the order of weeks, this seven glutamine construct will ultimately form um, amyloid fibrils. Um, so what that indicated to us that in this time frame where there appears to be no aggregation uh, occurring, there must be some type of um, exchange processes going on. Um, there's some type of dynamics in our system. Um, and, and the NMR data uh, indicates that, that, that that's what's happening here. So if I look at this, this top uh, right panel here, looking at the exchange-induced chemical shifts of the seven glutamine constructs as a function of concentrations, you see that those values are increasing. Um, and they're, interestingly, they increase um, um, in the N-terminal sequence more so than they do in the, in the poly-Q sequence. Um, so despite necessitating the, the seven glutamines, all of the action is happening um, in the uh, N-terminal sequence. Um, and, and if we look at the, the higher concentrations of just the N-terminal sequence, we don't see changes um, in the chemical shift, indicating that this, um, you know, this sequence on its own um, is not undergoing any type of exchange process. Um, at the same time, when we look at the um, R2 relaxation rates as a function of concentration, um, a one millimolar concentration of the seven glutamine constructs elicits this, um, this jagged profile of increased relaxation rates, um, whereas the, the 10 micromolar, we see this very flat um, curve in, in, in green here. Um, uh, that indicates also that we have some type of uh, chemical exchange um, going on in, in our sample um, as we move to higher concentrations. Um, we were able to, uh, for the seven glutamine construct, we can completely uh, abolish all of these exchange processes 
um, by oxidizing the methionine here. Um, and, and you see that at one millimolar concentrations, you no longer have um, this jagged profile, rather it, it mimics what you have at, at lower concentrations. And again, if we look at the concentration dependence of just the N-terminal sequence, we see that it is flat um, uh, it, at both one millimolar and 10 micromolar concentrations, indicating again that there is no um, exchange process going on um, for that N-terminal sequence. So uh, now, so using these relaxation, uh, uh, relaxation dispersion experiments, um, the, this CPMG relaxation dispersion and R1 rho relaxation dispersions, different flavors of the same form of, of NMR spectroscopy, as well as these exchange-induced chemical shifts as a function of concentration for our, our C alpha uh, carbons and performing these measurements on C alpha carbons and, and the nitrogens um, in the system. Uh, as a function of all of this data, as a function of concentration, um, we can globally fit all of the data um, to a set of equations that, uh, that to a kinetic scheme that best describes um, all of these data. Um, and this, uh, you, you know, in, in just a flip of a slide, I'm going to, uh, you know, condense two years of work into, into this, this slide here. Um, where the, the simplest model that, that made physical sense um, was the, is the one that, that is depicted here. Um, and that is that this monomeric protein is in steady state equilibrium exchange with uh, uh, what we termed a productive on pathway um, uh, process and a, a, and a uh, uh, non-productive off pathway process. And the reason we, we call this one productive is that um, based on the fits, the, the chemical shifts um, of these states here um, correspond to the amphipathic and terminus um, taking on a, a helical structure. Um, whereas the, if we look at the, the chemical shift for these states here, there's only partial helicity um, and, uh, and limited structure. Um, uh, furthermore, um, this uh, pathway here does uh, go on to form a tetrameric uh, a state as well, again, um, the chemical shifts indicating that um, we have a, a helical uh, anti-parallel, a parallel anti-parallel um, tetrameric structure that forms here. Uh, and so you may be wondering, looking at the, the KDs of these dimeric states, um, why we invoke the dimeric states at all. Um, it appears that we just simply bypass the state and, and, and there's you know, monomer to tetramer going on, uh, a monomer tetramer exchange rather. Um, but that uh, the probability that you go from monomeric to tetrameric is near zero. Um, so we invoke this dimeric state um, to give physical meaning to this model, despite the, the KDs being, being so high. Um, simultaneously, this uh, off pathway state is necessary um, to fit um, and complement um, the relaxation dispersion data. Uh, uh, um, otherwise, uh, the, the, the data just don't fit to a simple, you know, uh, three-state scheme. Um, uh, and again, the, the tetrameric species is necessary uh, to, uh, uh, to well describe these, these chemical exchange, uh, the exchange-induced chemical shifts. So you see the, the steepness of, of this growth um, indicates that, that there is something uh, beyond uh, a dimeric uh, state uh, in this scheme. And so in addition to elucidating a, this, this mechanism for the, this transient ligamerization events, um, we also used what are called intermolecular paramagnetic relaxation enhancement measurements um, to obtain uh, a, a structure or a structural model of the uh, 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 dimeric subunit and the, the tetramer species. Um, so using um, PRE measurements, uh, uh, it intrinsically in, uh, uh, contains intermolecular distance information. Um, and so modeling that in a, uh, with Explore NIH, uh, the Explore NIH program, um, you can see here that uh, the observed versus predicted uh, uh, PRE profile um, is very well correlated. Um, and what's more is that the PRE profile here in this, in this um, panel, um, in the lower, lower right panel here, um, uh, mimics um, a heptad repeat, which uh, 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 very well agrees with the 
uh, chemical shifts uh, uh, corresponding to a helical state um, in this N-terminal region um, of our molecule. The, uh, the other thing that, that my colleague Thomas Schmidt, who, who's on the paper, um, was able to do is, is confer, validate the intramolecular, or rather the intradimer um, distances via DEER and EPR measurements um, between uh, the, the uh, dimer subunit um, and, and uh, determine that it is in an anti-parallel uh, configuration. Um, so that was a, a very nice independent validation of, of, of that structural element. And, and following my, my leaving the, the court group, my colleague uh, uh, Alberto Chacon did uh, some follow-up work, very nice follow-up work, demonstrating that introduction of the polyproline-rich domain um, uh, does not alter the uh, 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 kinetic scheme that we developed um, substantially. Um, the, the major difference that uh, he found was that the uh, uh, dissociation constant um, was reduced uh, for the productive dimerization was reduced by nearly a factor of two. Um, and he did this using a similar set of measurements um, that, that I performed. Um, so it was very encouraging to see that this was not only reproducible, um, but also uh, that uh, how uh, identifying how this polyproline rich domain um, altered uh, the, the, the kinetic scheme, or rather altered the, the dissociation uh, constant for that dimerization process. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll briefly touch on uh, the, one of the ways, uh, one of the other ways, in addition to oxidizing the methionine, one of the other ways we were able to modulate um, uh, the aggregation uh, of these Huntington exon 1 peptide fragments um, was a work I did with my colleague Marielle um, in the Chlor group, where um, she had done some very nice work with, with Groiel. Um, sorry. Um, and so we decided to identify, you know, because uh, the bacterial or um, GROEL is the bacterial uh, homologue to H HSP60, um, we wanted to observe how this would uh, uh, inhibit, uh, whether it would inhibit the, the aggregation of, of the Huntington protein. And so we used a slew of, of NMR measurements um, in addition to relaxation dispersion and, and chemical shift deviations. We used uh, methodologies called DEST and lifetime line broadening. Um, to quantify the exchange processes between the, the monomeric form of, of Huntington um, and these intact GROEL, um, uh, as well as using uh, a variety of, of uh, imaging and fluorescent spectroscopy to show that um, both this GROEL um, and this isolated apical domain um, of GROEL. We, we isolated the apical domain here. Um, it's called, uh, we termed it the, the mini chaperone. I believe that's a literature term. Um, uh, and use that to identify that uh, this is the recognition site um, for uh, the, the Huntington sequence in, in Groyel, and that these uh, helix, uh, the, the apical domains recognition sequences of the helix H and helix I um, are the regions that bind to um, and sequester um, the, the Huntington peptide. Um, and you can see here the dissociation constants for the, the, uh, this isolated apical domain um, and the full intact area are, are quite similar. Um, and and uh, despite the low KD uh, between the, the Huntington protein um, and GROEL, uh, the avidity for these exon 1 fragments is high, um, given that the number of binding sites uh, accessible um, to the Huntington protein um, results in there being seven per ring. Um, and the other thing I'll point out is that this KD is over a hundredfold lower um, than the KD for um, these, what we call pre-nucleation um, oligomeric species uh, of Huntington. Um, so that, that, uh, that it inhibits um, the Huntington aggregation makes sense given that we've um, in, inhibited this, this uh, early self-association events. Um, so to conclude, um, you know, I use this term pre-nucleation um, for a very specific reason. Um, uh, it's a term that, that, that Marius actually decided to use um, because looking at uh, population of the species and thinking of, of nucleation as it pertains to amyloid aggregation, um, if you had 2% of, of your entire 
uh, of all of your molecules in some type of oligomeric state, and it was not aggregating you know, instantaneously, um, then that is obviously not a, a nucleating species. So we call these pre-nucleation events um, for these exon one fragments. Um, and so for the productive pathway, it's, um, it's the, the lifetime of these species um, is, is incredibly rapid on the order of 20 to, to 30 microseconds. Um, and then uh, for the non-productive dimer, it's on the order of about 400 microseconds. Um, and so in the, in the structure, again, the, the structure of this is an anti-parallel, uh, parallel anti-parallel dimeric uh, dimer of dimers um, that form this tetrameric species um, and that uh, we can modulate uh, this aggregation pathway by a number of methods, including, um, you know, introducing a, a chaperone like Groyel into the system. Um, and finally, uh, I'll just comment on the fact that uh, we view this species as, as um, the, the, the role of this tetrameric species as, as serving to increase the local concentration of the, of the poly-Q tract. So very obviously the poly-Q tract is necessary to stabilize the structure. However, if the poly-Q tract is not uh, long enough to allow it to efficiently overlap with other polyglutamine sequences, um, then uh, you will not have rapid aggregation. So the longer that glutamine sequence is, the, the more efficient it overlaps with other uh, poly-Q tracts, I think that's where you might get uh, a structure that is, you, you might deem a, a nucleating species um, for uh, Huntington aggregation. Uh, and so uh, I think that's my time. So with that, I will thank um, all those that, uh, that I worked with on this project, including Marius, um, Al Alberto, uh, uh, Thomas, and Vitaly and Marielle also were, were instrumental in, in this entire uh, project uh, when I was in Marius's group. Um, at the time, I was an, uh, uh, a postdoctoral research associate fellow with, through uh, NIGMS. And so if there are any um, graduate students out there, I highly encourage US-based um, graduate students, I highly encourage you to apply for this program. Um, it, was in, uh, it was phenomenal and you can email me if you want more questions about that. Um, Charles Schweders did all of the uh, structural modeling um, to determine the, the, the structure of the tetrameric species um, and the NMR support that we have in the, in the core lab um, and at the uh, Lab of Chemical Physics at NIH um, is, is truly phenomenal. Uh, Dusty Baber and Jin Fei Ying were um, incredibly supportive throughout the, my time there. So with that, I will um, stop and, and, and take any questions that you might have at this time. All right. Thanks, thanks Sam, for a great talk. Uh, really, it's a very like, challenging field to study the amyloid oligomers. So we can take some questions. So we have two questions in the Q&A. So do you want to read it by yourself or I can read it for you? So yeah, I, I'll read it. So the, the first question is, does your construct start with a methionine or alanine? If methionine, what's the effect of, of oxidation? So we, so we designed, so the, we express the, um, the Huntington uh, constructs as a fusion to uh, protein G, the immuno, immunoglobulin domain of protein G. Um, and we designed it specifically to exclude the N-terminal methionine because this, uh, gets cleaved in vivo. Um, so it starts with an alanine. So we, when we're um, oxidizing the species, we um, are only oxidizing the methionine, um, the M7 methionine uh, in the sequence. Um, and the, the, the second question here is, does the dimer only form at one millimolar concentration? No, the, so it's, a, it's concentration dependent. So the population uh, should have, um, I don't have a slide for this, but basically, your dimer concentration starts to uh, form as, as, as soon as that concentration for it to form becomes high enough. Um, and then it sort of stabilizes and becomes the intermediate pathway for tetramer. Um, and, and because the, 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 the strong concentration dependence on the, uh, of the tetramer, um, that's what's really, as you get to higher and higher concentrations, um, will start to uh, uh, dominate uh, the, the population here. But if I go back to this, this slide here. So um, you see that uh, at, so these uh, populations correspond to the population at the highest concentration used that is 1.2 millimolar. Um, 
And uh, so very early on, your, your um, uh, populations are dominated by, by dimer. But as soon as you reach a threshold for um, tetramerization, the tetramer very rapidly takes over uh, the population here. So this, this yeah, this, uh, these percentages correspond to a 1.2 millimolar concentration. I don't think I have the slide. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to include that. I should have. Let me see here. I, we have two more questions. Yeah. Um, how do you rule out trimer in your model of aggregation? And this, so um, we, we rule it out just based on. Um, so looking at this, looking at the, these exchange-induced chemical shifts, um, if you have monomer, dimer, trimer, um, you do not adequately, adequately fit the uh, exchange-induced chemical shifts. You underestimate that curve. So you, if you look at the steepness of this curve here, um, anything, uh, uh, you know, if it's just monomer to dimer, it's it's a linear it's a that curve would be linear so you can very clearly see it's nonlinear um, so there there must be um, some higher order of species there um, if it's trimer again you do not uh, get that uh, uh, you do not fit this latter part of the curve here so that's why we uh, have a monomer dimer uh, tetramer uh, scheme uh, that you see there. Um, and the second question here is, have you or anyone tried to compare the potency between Groyel versus small molecule aggregation inhibition, such as EGCG in terms of uh, amyloid inhibition? Um, no, no, we haven't. We didn't try any, any small molecule work. Um, I know that my, my, uh, my uh, uh, colleague Alberto um, also uh, uh, did similar um, uh, kinetic, studying the kinetics of of um, uh, how profilin inhibits um, Huntington aggregation. But uh, beyond that, uh, there, you know, most of the work in the core lab is focused on, on proteins. So very, very commonly we, we look to um, uh, the proteins being you know, a, as modulators of any type of, of aggregation system. And so there's another question here from how does P2 form from monomer? Do two unstructured monomers collide, or they form rare structured monomers and they collide to form P2? Um, well, that I don't know that we can answer that question. Um, do two unstructured monomers collide? Um, so, I, so this is from Dave Thermali. So you might know better the, than me about the uh, how rapid. Uh, the, the folding rate of, of, a, uh, of an alpha helical a segment, right? I mean, that can take nanoseconds for that, um, you know, N-terminal sequence to form that, that helix. Um, so what is obviously happening is that the, 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 the glutamines are necessary for the, the stabilization of the oligomeric species. So what we didn't actually look into um, or what, what, what there wasn't evidence of for the just the N terminal sequence was any um, uh, NOEs that indicate that the N terminal sequence alone um, forms some type of helical structure. So whether or not that, um, you know, maybe you have, uh, if I look at the, the, uh, the scheme here, you know, we just didn't have enough data to put in arrows between the off pathway and on pathway dimer. So maybe the off pathway dimer, you know, can convert into an on pathway dimer. Um, you know that, uh, you know, the the, the data already um, uh, are, are um, you know, we have a, a, a lot of data and a lot of information, but we just weren't able to uh, answer that that particular question. Um, that's a tough question. Maybe. E you could model it and, and tell us. I don't know. I, I, although I know Peter Wallenis has done some very nice uh, modeling work on, on the uh, Huntington fragments. So the answer could be in his paper there. That's a question from Jeff in the chat box. Uh, Jeff. Uh, oh, the chat box. 
Let me see. I don't have the chat box open. Um, can you read it to me, Rams? I don't see the chat box. Oh, wait. Okay, uh, can the C13 shift of the excited state be inferred from the relaxation dispersion experiment? If so, do you think it's possible to reconstruct the structure of the excited state by Rosetta or other computational techniques? Um, yeah, that's, that, that's possible. I mean, we, we also see, um, so in addition to the alpha chemical shifts, we also see changes in chemical shifts for the C beta um, uh, and, and carbonyl carbons as well, um, also tending towards uh, alpha helical. Um, is it possible? Um, potentially, but the relaxation dispersion experiments, yeah, they, they provide you with the chemical shifts of the, of the, uh, of the tetrameric and or dimeric and tetrameric states. Um, so those are intrinsic to the fits of the C13 uh, chemical shift dispersion data. Um, so in theory, yeah, you could use the chemical shifts of those to uh, use Rosetta or, or other computation techniques to, um, uh, uh, to calculate a structure, but we knew that the uh, N-terminal sequence was helical. Um, so we just took a, you know, a, a perfect helical model um, for the PRE data and use that to uh, construct uh, the dimer tetramer model, model that you see there. Um, there's another question here. Uh, can you comment on the proline forming PP2 structure in relation to the oligomer formation of N17? Um, so unfortunately, no. Um, I don't believe um, you know, in, in, in this slide here. Uh, I, I don't believe they, they looked at this in this work here. Um, you know, this is something Alberto did after I, I left the lab. Um, presumably it forms, you know, uh, at, at least a, some type of dynamic PB2 helix. I mean, you see that in the, uh, in the fiber structure. Um, so I would imagine that uh, it's at least transient formation of a PB2 helix. Um, there for the oligomeric species, but I don't think we can definitively say that for sure. All right, Sam, thanks again for the great talk. So moving forward, uh, our next speaker today is Dr. Anup Arunaragi, uh, Arunagiri from uh, University of Michigan. Uh, so briefly, uh, uh, Dr. Onop received his PhD from one of the prestigious Indian Institute. So it's the Indian Institute of Bombay. And after receiving his PhD, uh, Onop joined University of Michigan as a postdoc and worked with Professor Peter Arian, uh, who serves as the director of University of Michigan Comprehensive uh, Diabetes Center. Uh, uh, and it's a pleasure that uh, recently I, uh, he, uh, Dr. Onop is promoted to the research in, uh, investigator in, at the University of Michigan. And he received several awards and recently he elected as a member uh, of the Royal Society of Biology. Uh, so congratulations on, uh, on uh, both your position and for the award. So with that brief introduction, uh, I would like to invite you to take the floor and start with your presentation. Uh, thank you because and the organizers uh, to uh, invite me to give this talk. So, uh, this talk is going to be slightly different from what Samuel talked about today. So I'm going to talk about pro-insulin misfolding and aggregation relevant to beta cell dysfunction in diabetes. So diabetes is a serious metabolic disorder that affects millions of people around the world. Uh, genetics, family history, diet-induced obesity, autoimmunity, these are some factors that may influence uh, or cause diabetes. Our lab in Michigan focuses on protein folding problems uh, in, uh, associated with this uh, disorder. So irrespective of what factors may lead to diabetes, it has been recognized that uh, the beta cell failure or the inability of the pancreatic beta cells to make insulin hormone is the key problem here. So let's first take a look at the beta cells. So uh, where are the beta cells located? In the pancreas, there are these small little islands of endocrine tissue scattered throughout, and these uh, which are called uh, islets of Langerhans or simply islets. Within these islets are the beta cells located. So what, what, what do these beta cells do? 
they store and secrete the insulin hormone. So here is a picture of beta cell. You see, this is an electron micrograph of a pancreatic uh, slice that shows the beta cells. Uh, these cells have the nucleus and other intracellular organelles. And I want you to focus on this small little uh, vesicle-like structures. These are called secretory granules. And within each of these, there is about 0.1 million insulin molecules. And there are about a thousand of these granules in the beta cells. So imagine how much of insulin the beta cells make and they, they store. So what do they do with this stored insulin? As soon as we uh, take a meal, our blood glucose levels go up. Then the body asks the beta cells to release the insulin so that the blood glucose can come back to normal. So beta cells store this insulin and they release it when the blood glucose goes up. And after that, it refills these granules. Again, uh, the, uh, the, the storage pool is replenished. So to make and store this much of insulin, the, the, the beta cell work really, really hard. Now, this is all under a normal, happy, healthy blood glucose levels. In a normal individual, this is what happens. But now think about the diabetic condition. In there, the blood glucose is constantly going up and it's not under control. Under such a circumstance, the beta cell has to overwork and an exhausted beta cell eventually gives up and uh, fails to uh, secrete insulin. And that's when there is uh, diabetes. So as long as you have insulin, you are protected from diabetes. So insulin is the savior here. It's been 100 years uh, since uh, the insulin was discovered. In 1921, it was discovered. And this is the first uh, protein to have its sequence determined. And about the structure, insulin uh, is made of a B chain and A chain that are connected by two disulfide bonds. And then there is a third disulfide bond, which is intra-chain within the A chain. So there are three disulfide bonds in this insulin structure. And these disulfide bonds give uh, the stability to the structure, but it also uh, is important for the biological activity, for the insulin to bind to its receptor. So uh, this is about uh, the insulin structure, but uh, does beta cell produce insulin directly? How, does ins how is insulin made in these beta cells? So to answer that question, we have to go uh, 50 years back from now in the late uh, 60s, uh, Donald Steiner uh, did some experiments where he incubated pancreatic uh, adenoma tissue slices in a medium containing tritium labeled leucine or, uh, and phenylalanine. And he found that uh, in, from the extracts of his samples that in addition to insulin, there is one higher molecular weight species in his gel filtration chromatography. So uh, that was oh, later dis Excuse me? Oh, sorry. Okay, so that higher molecular weight species was uh, later discovered as the precursor called proinsulin. So proinsulin is the precursor hormone to insulin. This is the uh, protein that's made first in the beta cells, and this pro hormone proinsulin then gets converted to insulin. So where is this pro-insulin made? It is synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum and uh, this enters the in, inside the endoplasmic reticula and the signal peptide is cleaved and the protein starts folding. As soon as the pro-insulin folds, it starts forming these disulfide bonds. So the structure in pro-insulin is very similar to the insulin. It has the B chain, A chain and the disulfide bonds. In addition to that, there is this C peptide. So this is the difference between the pro-insulin and insulin structure-wise. So what happens after pro-insulin folds to this native structure? It moves forward. It moves forward from the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, to the Golgi. And from there, it goes and packs into the secretory granules. And that is where pro-insulin is converted to insulin. That C peptide that you saw here, that's removed from there and that is the insulin structure. So insulin is stored in these granules and that you saw in the very first slide. Uh, so this is the process how proinsulin is converted to insulin. And the key step here is the folding. Only the well-folded proinsulin with all its uh, native disulfide bonds, this can go forward from the ER to the Golgi and then make insulin. But not all the time this folding of proinsulin is successful under some unfavorable ER folding environment, such as in diabetes, 
there is a problem to the folding and we call that misfolding. So we are going to talk about pro-insulin misfolding uh, today. So what may cause pro-insulin misfolding? There are two broad ideas. I'm going to talk one about first about the gene mutations in insulin gene that may lead to misfolding or the unfavorable ER environment that can lead to pro-insulin misfolding. So just to give you an outline of what, what I'll be uh, reiterating in this talk again, is that a well-folded pro-insulin can go forward from the endoplasmic reticulum to Golgi and then convert to insulin, while a misfolded pro-insulin is stuck in the ER. It cannot go beyond the ER. So there is uh, relatively less insulin made here that may lead to diabetes. So first looking at the uh, insulin gene mutations. Uh, our lab has been uh, studying uh, several uh, familial insulin gene mutations that results in a protein product, proinsulin, that cannot fold well. And we have uh, seen the misfolding of proinsulin implicated in a condition called mutant insulin gene induced diabetes of youth. That is the uh, term we coined. We call it in short as MIDI. So these MIDI mutants can massively misfold and they aggregate uh, inside the endoplasmic reticulum. So before going into how MIDI can cause the misfolding here, I would like to just introduce you to some uh, mutant important mutations and also the specifics of the disulfide bonds. So there, were th there are three disulfide bonds in pro-insulin as well as insulin, right? So this is how we name it. B7A7, for example, means the seventh amino acid in the B chain is connected with the seventh amino acid in the A chain of proinsulin. So that is the B7A7. Likewise, B19, A20 means the 19th amino acid in the B chain is connected with the 20th amino acid in the A chain. So these uh, different colors indicate either cysteine substitution mutations or non-cysteine mutations. So uh, one cysteine substitution mutation that we are going to talk about today is will affect one of these disulfide bonds in the structure. So that mutation is called Akita, where the seventh a, a, a cysteine in the A chain is replaced by a tyrosine. So this will affect this B7A7 and therefore will lead to mispairing and eventually misfolding. We'll talk about that now. So first let's take a, a look at this uh, Akita mouse model. Mouse have, have two genes, mice have two insulin genes, and like humans which, who have only one. Uh, in the two insulin genes, uh, in Akita's case, uh, one gene is perfectly fine, the insulin one, but the insulin two gene has a problem in one of the alleles. It has a single point mutation, and that leads to misfolding uh, of the protein that's made from there. And this misfolded Akita proinsulin can aggregate itself inside the ER, and further, it can also affect the bystander wild-type proinsulin that's made from the rest of the uh, allele. So good proinsulin is now stuck inside the ER due to the uh, interaction with this bad misfolded proinsulin. Thus, it's the, the, the wild-type proinsulin is unavailable to go forward to making insulin. So uh, in mouse models, we have seen that even if we remove three alleles out of the total four alleles, they can still manage the blood glucose. So one allele is sufficient. But in the Akita case, we see there are three good alleles still there, and there is just one which is uh, having the mutation. So it's, it's probably not a loss of function mutation, rather it's a gain of toxic function that leads to this dominant negative effect of the misfolded mutant proinsulin on the wild type proinsulin, sequestering it within the endoplasmic reticulum. So uh, now let's take a look at some of the biochemical evidences that we have from this Akita um, uh, model. How can we characterize this aggregate? So uh, we isolated Akita islets and we ran a SDS page and uh, uh, did a Western blotting using proinsulin specific antibody to find there is a single band for proinsulin on a reducing gel. So Akita is able to making, make some proinsulin. So what is the problem here? Why do they get diabetes? The problem is this. When we look at the non-reducing side, you see this monomeric proinsulin band that becomes weaker and there are more proinsulin concentrated in the top part of the gel, meaning that the relative abundance of proinsulin is shifted to aggregates and very less to the native monomer, which means the proinsulin is, uh, the, the native proinsulin is overall uh, less in this thing, in this uh, system, therefore leading to less insulin 
production. We also did uh, similar experiments uh, where uh, analyzed similar analysis wherein we had Akita uh, plasmid uh, and compare that with the wild type plasmid in the non-beta cells called 293T cells. When we overexpressed either the wild type or Akita, we found that uh, the, the wild type was able to uh, go from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell while the Akita built up the inside the cell, but it was unable to go forward. So the reason again is that the Akita was able, is, is forming these disulfide linked aggregates, which is preventing their forward movement from the ER and to the uh, further to the secretory pathway to uh, getting released outside. So that means that the, these kind of medium mutants, including Akita, form the disulfide linked aggregates of proinsulin that's uh, preventing them from moving forward. So in case of Akita, it can be simply explained that there is this uh, cysteine, which is is uh, replaced here. So one of the important native disulfide bonds is missing. So that cysteine substitution can lead to this problem of mispairing initially, finally, eventually leading to misfolding and aggregation. But that's not true because we saw in the cartoon earlier that there are several non-cysteine mutations also. So let's take a quick look at some of the non-cysteine mutations. So here, none of the native cysteine is substituted. Of course, there are some cysteines added in some cases though, but uh, native cysteine remains normal. However, just like in Akita, even these mutants of proinsulin were unable to uh, successfully secrete uh, into uh, outside of the cell, unlike a wild type, which uh, very well secretes uh, the proinsulin. So once again, just like in the case of Akita, most of these uh, midi mutants, all, are, all of these are familial mutants reported in patients. They are all able to make this disulfide linked aggregates. Uh, so now we know that uh, midi mutation that can affect the cysteine and affect the native disulfide bond or any mutation, any non-cysteine mutation, I mean, that can affect the structure of the protein uh, and affect the folding can eventually lead to aggregation. It doesn't have to be a cysteine substitution. We further looked at the localization of these aggregates uh, inside the cell. So we found that uh, while these form large disulfide linked aggregates inside the cell, they look like this. The mutant is mostly localized in the endoplasmic reticulum. It's the dispersed pattern that you see here, while the wild type advances from the endoplasmic reticulum and it is mostly uh, concentrated in this just nuclear area. That's where the Golgi is. And then it will go forward and make insulin, but the mutant cannot. So that's what is, uh, uh, I'm showing in this cartoon. The mutant misfolded protein is retained in the ER and is unable to go forward. So next we ask the question, okay, now we know that the mutant can itself aggregate to into these disulfide linked uh, complexes, but how does it affect wild type? So for that, we co-transfected the wild type uh, proinsulin and the mutant in the uh, non-beta cells here. And here, one of them is an epitope type so that we can distinguish the mutant from the wild type when we analyze our results. So when we ran our non-reducing gel, uh, which does not have any DTT, so we, all we see is these disulfide linked aggregates. We see that the wild type and wild type can dimerize. Also the mutant and mutant can dimerize, but we also find there are heterodimers wherein the mutant and wild type can dimerize. So that means <clears throat> the diabetes causing proinsulin mutants uh, can physically interact with the wild type and they can heteromerize. So they engage the wild type in probably in this disulfide linked aggregates this way. So now we know that the mutants can physically interact. So uh, we did a very similar experiment of co-transfecting wild type and mutant. And then we looked at them to visualize uh, the trafficking of proinsulin. We did a immun immunofluorescence. And uh, here is uh, one uh, example, uh, which I wanted to show you. There are two cells here. Uh, so this is cell number one, this is cell number two. While in the cell number one, the wild type proinsulin is mostly in the juxtanuclear uh, space where it has to be because it's going forward from the ER. The cell number two shows mostly proinsulin concentrated in the endoplasmic reticulum. So the, what is the reason for that? It is uh, simply because the second cell also has a mutant proinsulin expressing that you see in this green channel. So that is the reason that's again comes to this cartoon, the misfolded proinsulin Akita mutation in this case is able to drag the wild type into their 
uh, and making some kind of co-aggregation scenario uh, and eventually sequestering the wild type within the endoplasmic reticulum. So that's why we call this a dominant negative effect of the mutant on the wild type. So with that, I, I, I'm going to just show you a final uh, 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 variant. It's not a, exactly a midi mutant, a variant that we, uh, we are calling as B22 variant. And here, it, this experiment is slightly different from the rest of the experiments. The, the Whatever I showed is related to Western bloating, but this is a pulse chase experiment. So using this, this is like taking a video rather than taking a photograph. So uh, here we can uh, look at uh, things uh, uh, using radio labeled uh, amino acids, we can see proinsulin synthesis, proinsulin to insulin conversion, and then proinsulin or insulin secretion uh, outside of the cell. So I want you to look at these two bands. So that band on the top is oxidized proinsulin with all the disulfide bonds intact. And from that much proinsulin, it, the wild type makes that much insulin, which is not bad. But now let's move to the mutant, uh, the variant. In here, to start with, there is a very less proinsulin, and from there, obviously, less insulin is made. So why is there less proinsulin in this case? Once again, as with other mutations that we saw, there is this disulfide-linked aggregates that is formed in this variant. This is for the first time we are showing using a pulse chase approach that uh, mutant is uh, visibly showing this disulfide linked aggregate. So here we can correlate the formation of these aggregates with the production of insulin. So what we have seen so far, the mutant mutation in proinsulin can result in its self-aggregation, but it can also cause the mutation uh, interaction with wild type can also cause the co-aggregation scenario. And uh, this aggregation of the, the mutant can result in decreased insulin production. So this is one direct evidence that can uh, give us that idea. So uh, with that, uh, so we are uh, done with this part where gene mutation can lead to misfolding. Let's move to the second part of the talk where I'm going to tell you about the unfavorable ER folding environment. The endoplasmic reticulum in the beta cells have several proteins, chaperons and co-chaperons and oxidorotases and other divalent cations uh, that help or regulate proinsulin folding. So we wanted to look at which are, which are these proteins that govern uh, successful folding of proinsulin in the ER. So for this, I am only going to show you two examples here. Uh, where I'll be hitting one protein at a time. These are proteins involved in uh, controlling the, uh, they are involved in the unfolded protein response in the endoplasmic reticulum. And this is a chaperone, which is HSP70 family chaperone called BIP. So we'll hit two proteins here. First, the PERC uh, protein. Uh, this has some roles in uh, attenuating proteins and controlling protein synthesis in the cell. So when I inhibit PERC using a certain inhibit kinase inhibitor, what we find here is the proinsulin goes to the disulfide linked aggregates. But what's the difference here? There is no sequence mutation. This is simply the wild type native proinsulin. And this goes into this massive aggregates, disulfide linked aggregates, when the PERC activity, uh, the kinase activity of the PERC is inhibited. And also we see, just like we saw in the mutants, the proinsulin is uh, concentrated in the endoplasmic reticulum here again, and it cannot go forward. So wherever we see these disulfide-linked aggregates, we also see that the proinsulin is localized in the ER. Okay, now moving on to the next uh, uh, protein, it's going to be the HSP70 protein, BIP, and we used a certain toxin called sub-AB that uh, cleaves BIP. So within 120 minutes of BIP cleavage, you see that the proinsulin again goes into this aggregates, meaning that BIP is uh, having some role to play in controlling proinsulin aggregation. <clears throat> so this again, uh, like uh, PERC inhibitor showed disulfide linked aggregates, but also showed ER localization when uh, we saw these aggregates. So this is all uh, pharmacological that, that we are adding some toxins and then we are seeing some effects. So we wanted to give our story some physiological context. So for that, we move to a mouse model. So that's a type two di uh, diabetes uh, mouse model. So before that, I would just want to tell you about the type two diabetes, wherein as the blood glucose increases, uh, there needs to be more insulin made. So for making more insulin, the cell has to first make more pro-hormone, which is the pro-insulin. So there is already increased protein overload or hypersynthesis of pro-insulin in type two diabetes. 
the er is very much expanded in these uh, cells and there is also severe er stress in this uh, previously reported so the er folding environment the er homeostasis is already perturbed in this system so we asked a question uh, what is the status of pro insulin folding in this model so for that we use the dbdb mouse model so this mouse has a mutation in leptin receptor leptin is a hormone that uh, secreted from peripheral tissues and it binds to leptin receptor in the brain and uh, its binding to its receptor through the leptin receptor regulates food intake and energy expenditure uh, so this animals with a mutation in the leptin receptor is unable to detect hunger so this animal keeps eating a lot and then they develop hyperglycemia they uh, become obese insulin resistance and then they finally uh, develop uh, diabetes so it's a pretty good type 2 diabetic model we find that in the diabetic uh, dbdb mice there is a loss of total insulin compared to a wild type uh, earlier it was proposed that it's mostly due to beta cell death but uh, we found that probably that's not true because when we stain with pro insulin there many cells light up but the most important thing to note here is that the pro insulin localization pro insulin is not anymore in the juxta nuclear space just like in the wild type but it's mostly in the endoplasmic reticulum in this model so uh, there is a low pro insulin high in, uh, so low insulin and high pro insulin and mostly it's localized in the endoplasmic reticulum so we wondered if the endoplasmic reticulum localization of the er once again is related to increased pro insulin synthesis here beyond the capacity of the er that may be leading to misfolding so for that we collected islets uh, from these animals these are the different blood glucoses of the animals that i am showing here and uh, we ran our regular sds page gel and uh, did a western blotting pro insulin western blotting we see that the uh, at a normal blood glucose levels the total pro insulin level is not very much altered nor are the insulin levels however when the animals start developing diabetes then the uh, beta cells have to make more pro insulin so that they can make more insulin but here to our surprise these animals did make more pro insulin but they did not make enough insulin from pro insulin so why is that once again these pro insulin that more pro insulin that's made in the early diabetic stage they all go into these aggregates and at an expense of making insulin most pro insulin is getting soaked into this aggregate so basically there are three stages that are in here i'm showing you here at the early stage uh, in the diabetes there is already the formation of these disulfide linked aggregates uh, and but there is enough insulin so the animal is uh, still okay but uh, it doesn't get diabetic but then when the animal starts to go uh, show higher blood glucose there is more uh, of these aggregates because there is more pro insulin but there is less insulin and from there the beta cell starts failing because if there is no insulin you will get diabetes so that's what we are showing here and this is uh, 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 important finding which shows that the pro-insulin misfolding precedes the onset of the full-blown diabetes. So that way the misfolding or pro-insulin aggregation in this case could be used as an indicator of uh, the uh, onset of type 2 diabetes because DBDB is a type 2 diabetic model. So uh, once again showing you that cartoon uh, which is used earlier for the mutant pro-insulins even in this wild type uh, pro insulin condition uh, when there is excessive misfolding and aggregation the pro insulin is stuck in the er and it cannot go forward so in all these experiments that we saw we clearly can uh, understand there are some uh, predisposition of this pro insulin molecule to get aggregated so we ask the question if there are any free available cysteines because these are all disulfide linked aggregates so are there free available cysteines in this molecule that is causing this aggregation so for that uh, we used a thiol reactive agent called ams that upon binding to a cysteine will add a 0.5 kilodalton molecular mass so when we add the uh, ams and then compare the uh, uh, without ams and with ams sample side by side we find that there is a tiny shift that 0.5 kilodalton addition of ams 
has caused a tiny shift in all of these oligomers, which means that each of these dimer, trimer, and so on in proinsulin has free thiols that can recruit more misfolded molecules uh, together and uh, form this kind of large molecular weight aggregates. <clears throat> so with this, we come to our last question, which is, okay, there are three evolutionarily conserved disulfide bonds in proinsulin. Which of these bonds is involved in the high molecular weight aggregation? So to answer that, Lena in our group uh, created uh, some uh, artificial constructs of proinsulin. That is a native structure with the three disulfide bond. So she created um, uh, proinsulins with uh, uh, only two cysteines. She uh, uh, side directed mutagenized all the rest of the four, and there are only two cysteines uh, that would only lead to one uh, disulfide bond formation at a time. So each of these can form only one of the native disulfide bonds. So when we analyze these, uh, when we overexpress these in 293 cells and we analyzed our non-reducing gel, we find it's not the keep A6A11, not the B7A7, but only the B19A20 bond. That bond is necessary and that is sufficient to create that laddering of uh, disulfide linked aggregates of proinsulin. So either B19 or A20 can participate in this intermolecular disulfide linked aggregates of proinsulin. And here are the different scenarios. It could be a B19 from one proinsulin connecting to A20 of the other, or uh, B19, B19, or A20, A20. And uh, these are the different oligomerization scenarios that can take place. And this may be the ones that we are seeing in vivo in the uh, diabetic models too. So with that, I would like to conclude by saying that while the insulin gene mutations can result in pro-insulin aggregation, they can also co-aggregate with the uh, wild type. They can recruit them and hold them back in the ER, and that eventually leads to decrease the secretion of pro-insulin or insulin. Uh, while unfavorable ER folding environment uh, leads to self-association of uh, Proinsulin that has free thiols in them, even in the absence of any mutation, simply proinsulin can self aggregate and uh, they are mostly located in the endoplasmic reticulum and this can affect the insulin production just as we saw in the type 2 diabetes model. So, both of these conditions will may lead to stress in the endoplasmic reticulum and eventually lead to beta cell failure seen in diabetes. So, with that, I would like to thank the audience and also. Uh, University of Michigan Medical School, uh, all the R1 lab members, and uh, I am open to questions. Thank you. Thanks, Anup, for the great talk. So we have one question. So would you like to read it in the Q&A? Or I can read it for you. Yeah. Um, it's from Christian, right? Yeah. OK. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it was tested before uh, and uh, proinsulin as such did not uh, bind well to thioflavin T and it was proposed that the, uh, the, the C peptide in the proinsulin prevents it, it from forming uh, these kind of amyloid-like aggregates. While insulin by itself can form amyloid aggregates, but uh, the C peptide in proinsulin acts like some kind of a topology tether and prevents its, uh, its conformational change to making aggregates. So their thiofluent T is not that great. Although they do form some kind of amorphous aggregates uh, with bit, which are beta sheet rich, but they do not form amyloid like fibril. So the binding is not so great. Thanks for the question. Yeah, so we have another question. In... Oh, no. uh, yeah, I, I found that question from Gunilla, which asked whether the uh, uh, the Western blot of ubiquity. No, we have not done that. Uh, yeah, that's a good comment. Uh, we have to uh, think about that and we'll try doing that. We, we have not done that yet, yet. So you are trying to say that it's possible that uh, they may be, uh, these, these are all targeted to degradation. Uh, I think that's what you mean. So yeah, uh, it, it's a good it's a good point, yeah. Thanks for the question, Gurinder. Okay, I don't see any question in the Q and A. So I have a couple of questions for you, Anup. Very nice sure. work. So, like uh, in connection to the last question from Christian, I was wondering, looking at your HDSP gel, it looks like even though your dimer and tetramer like is very intense uh, bands you have, 
still i could see some spe- like smear kind of like band in the top like the high molecular weight reach so i was right. wondering like have you ever tried to like uh, characterize the morphology of those kind of aggregates like the big aggregates uh, we have not exactly done that uh, as i said uh, it was previously uh, 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 people tried to characterize that either at a physiological ph 7.4 or uh, like from the starting i mean uh, using a recombinantly purified proinsulin and uh, uh, they did find that the the proinsulin was able to aggregate and they formed some kind of amorphous structures but uh, we ex- uh, particularly did not look at this high molecular weight and characterize them we are interested in that uh, but we need to get a better resolution because we think that in those higher molecular weight uh, areas it may be not just proinsulin but proinsulin uh, bound with other proteins uh like chaperones and all which which may be like the question that gunila is raising uh, you know the, those proteins that may uh, bring the proinsulin aggregates to a degradation or it may be promoting it or preventing it those in, those may be also involved in those higher molecular weight is what we think because uh, this is based on uh, a re- some recent uh, immunoprecipitation experiments where we found that uh, some of these chaperones are able to pull down those larger aggregates actually more than the smaller ones and what so what are, are the and what are the pathological conditions for those dimers and trimers like do they dysfunction the er function or like have you ever tested those uh, that that's what we think we exactly do not know if they uh, have an immediate effect on the er but what we know here is that since these higher molecular weight including the oligomers for the dimer trimer and so on most of them are uh, stuck in the er uh, they the, the proinsulin is probably not available to make insulin because insulin is the key here right it has to go out and then only the blood glucose can come on control so this has a pathological effect from that aspect that insulin is not made probably because of this aggregation pro insulin is not available for that so that's what we think uh, but it of course it could also lead to overall uh, er you know homeostasis disturbance because increased accumulation of pro insulin within this uh, uh, is not good for the cells so yes it's possible that there is er stress okay we have a next question from binju uh okay. Okay. Um, can you comment on potential feasible ways to correct the aggregation? Does BIP inhibit proinsulin aggregation in vitro? Okay. Uh, we are still uh, trying to uh, understand this. Uh, we are trying to find out ways that can either promote proinsulin folding or prevent misfolding. Uh, like we have identified some of the uh, proteins in collaboration that that like chaperones that can dissolve the some of the aggregates formed from specifically formed by mutant uh, proinsulin so uh, if there is a way to activate those chaperones then yes we could possibly uh, uh, you know prevent the pre, uh, or dissolve the preformed aggregates uh, but we are still not there uh, to to answer that uh, if uh, there are ways to uh correct the aggregation uh, there are many suggestions uh, like uh, chemical chaperones can be used or tried we have not done that yet but we are st- constantly looking at small molecule drugs first that can uh, uh, you know correct this uh, aggregation and does bip inhibit proinsulin aggregation uh, in vitro i don't remember if it can but maybe there is one study where they tried putting bip and proinsulin in solution and uh, but i don't remember the results sorry for that so uh, there is another question from says sir in your model have you ths no we have not tried ths yet uh, it's a good suggestion uh, people might have already uh, started doing that but i think tht uh, in solution does not show does not show any binding for proinsulin aggregates we have to do uh, ths to see if uh, it stains there there is a question in the chat box from jeff okay i i am unable this my my this thing got okay. frozen i can talk to you Okay, is, I, I glutathione localization or availability linked to the disulfide misfolding? Hmm, that's a good one. Uh, 
it may be like uh, if there is an interaction of this with the cytoplasm, that may be the situation when that can happen. But I have not specifically looked at the glutathione in the uh, ER with respect to this. Yes, uh, uh, having that in the picture actually affects the native folding of the protein. So it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I don't have a direct answer to that. Okay, so with that, now we are open to take questions for both the speakers. So if you want to ask a question, please raise your hands. We'll allow you to, to talk directly with the speakers. All right, so great talk, see. really like it very much, guys. Yeah. Um, both Sam and Anup. Sam, I have a question for you. I, will, I have a question for Anup as well. So Sam, um, in your uh, dimer tetramer formation, it, mm -hmm. how is there any possibility that you lose uh, some kind of population in because you're using solution of mass spectroscopy, so you cannot observe higher order oligomers or higher order protofibers, so, fibers, and so on? So, how do you account for that? So we, happening or not happening? we monitor the intensity of the monomer, right? So based on the intensity of the monomer and the fact that we don't lose monomer, um, whether we lose uh you know oligomer intensity i mean that's hard to to know but um presumably if you lose oligomer you lose monomer as well so right. we, it, all of that is is knowing that our, our monomer population is stable thus the the other populations must be stable as well so that means that once it becomes oligomer they can be lost which you are not monitoring and you cannot account that right account but, them in your but model. um i mean if you're losing all material, right? If you're if you're losing material, then you would expect to lose monomer as well. So if let's say you had a unidirectional arrow after the tetramer, yeah. right, then you're depleting all of your the population of the steady state equilibrium, which ultimately it it, it does happen. Um, ultimately you do form a nucleating species, but um, the efficiency is so low with seven glutamines that it takes substantially high concentrations in just a very, very long time. So the, the fact that we don't lose monomer signal um, says to us that we're not, you know, aggregating um, in, the, in the time frame that we perform those measurements, right? So we have to, I mean, we have weeks, right? We have, I think, three to four weeks before um, you start seeing a, a loss of your monomer signal. But in that time frame, um, you know, we, we don't see the formation of large aggregates. So, and, and to uh, further comment on that, I would say we tried uh, experiments with the Huntington on the, that Q7 construct and DEST um, doesn't work. So there are no large aggregates there um, at that time. So it's, it's, it's just those species that are, are in that model. So I'm sure this equilibrium depends on the temperature and pH and concentration sure all sure. the variables we, right yeah we didn't we didn't uh modulate uh, so uh we did some of the measurements at, at 10 degrees um so you you still see um tetramer at 10 degrees but uh, we didn't go above that because again the aggregation starts sooner than uh than you can measure um it, perform all of the measurements uh, on those samples so yeah, um, the, 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 the tricky part of solution state NMR, yeah. Sure, yeah. thank you. Oh, Anup, great talk, really enjoyed it very much. Mm -hmm. So in your case, you did mention about other uh, proteins are also involved in this uh, amorphous aggregate formation of pro-insulin. Are there any other cofactors like free lipids or carbohydrates or metals or anything involved in this promotion of pro-insulin aggregation? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it, we still do not know if there is any direct uh, link like that of any divalent cation, for example, but we are now trying to uh, understand that the calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum has some role to play indirectly. Calcium is important for uh, maintaining the chaperone functions in the ER. Some of the chaperones are dependent on calcium, so a loss of ER calcium uh, can actually promote aggregation is what we think, and that may be related to the 
chaperone function here. Uh, also, we are trying to now study the importance of ATP, which is generated from um, probably the source is mitochondria that uh, comes into the ER. And that may again affect not proinsulin directly, but uh, some other proteins like chaperones, which uh, depend on uh, ATP. And there again, we think the insulin could misfold. So these are some uh, non-protein uh, partners that may be playing a role or, uh, in, in pro-insulin folding within the ER. So we are studying that. We are exploring more conditions that may lead to misfolding. Thanks for the question. Okay. We don't see much hand raising today. So maybe I, I, I have a couple of questions. So Magda, do you have any question? Um, I have a question for the, the uh, for poly Q uh, expansions. Um, and um, Sam, can you tell um, there there should be some a linker uh, like linker linker kind of residues between the heli uh, the N terminal helix and uh, the polycules, how, how big is that linker in your opinion? So because you so, can't just, it needs some space that helix to be fitted into yeah, the so sheet. The, actually in the model, the first glutamine is actually first, first two or first. So the, 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 um, so the first two display helical conformation, but I think only the first has uh, a chemical shift that's large enough to conclusively state that it's in the helix. So uh, at least for this construct, I can't speak to the, the fibers, um, but uh, in our structure, right, the, some of those glutamines take, take on a, a helix. So the, in terms of there being um, a linker um, for us, you know, you've got the first two residues disordered and then the last, you know, uh, five or six glutamines are disordered. So, um, you know, there's, there's no, you know, in, in our construct, there's no linker to another structure. Rather, you have disordered tails and, uh, and that uh, alpha helical segment. Mm -hmm. in, in my second question is, it's a bit of a speculation. Uh, I know that you are studying just a short s segment, uh, but uh, Huntington protein is really, really large. Can you speculate a little bit how you think it's fitting in the whole fibrillar model? So, the, yeah, the, um, the idea is, is that, uh, well, seven glutamines is, um, is sufficient to form fibers. So you can form, you know, fibrillar structures. What those structures are, we don't know. We didn't, we didn't, um, you know, beyond doing imaging um, and THT measurements, we did not um, do anything beyond that with uh, seven glutamines. Um, so the idea how it, you know, relates to, you know, Huntington aggregation at large is that one thing that is known and that in, in the introduction, uh, um, I touched on it is that the N terminal sequence rapidly or increases the rate of aggregation very rapidly. So the idea is, is that it forms, um, the, the helix is what forms first, and then you need a long enough polyglutamine track to uh, form the, the fibrillar structures. This is also speculation. You know, I don't, I don't know that, that this is the exact sequence of events. But the idea is, is that um, the end terminal sequence, when it forms, uh, you know, nuke, uh, you know, forms these 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 structures, intermediate structures, is that it's increasing the local concentration of the of the poly Q track, um, and then the the glutamines can interact with one another to stabilize the structure and form an actual nucleating species that that triggers, you know, this uh, really. Uh, rapid kinetics towards towards fibril. Yeah, but, yeah thank you. That's that, that's kind of explains it. The, the reason why I was kind of uh, was asking that question is um, I, it has been all always mind bottling. Uh, what what determines the critical length of the polycues? Because there are lots of polycue 
yeah. diseases and uh, the polycule length is different from for the different proteins so, that, so that's that's why i was kind yeah, of asking that question um, if, if do you have any ideas about that because it's so uh yeah that's that's i think that's and that's one of the the, the big questions in the field right is that what why 35 right why not 34 i mean 34 you know, there's this seems to be a very tight threshold of 35. I, I don't know why. Uh, well, I guess you have the 35 to 40, right, is later onset Huntington's. And then after 40 is when you really start having, um, you know, you know, people in their 40s and 50s that have severe symptoms. Um, and then you get up into hundreds of glutamines and you have, you know, uh, very early onset um, Huntington's disease. But there is um, a species of some type of slime that has, uh, there's a JBC paper on this, um, that has a, a high number of poly-Q proteins and also a very, very high number uh, of small uh, chaperones in their genome. And so the, the, the speculation in that paper was that you have a lot of chaperone activity that inhibits, right? And they don't for, they, you know, the slime doesn't suffer from poly-Q. You don't see poly-Q aggregates in the slime. Um, so the, the notion there is, is that you have a lot of chaperone activity that uh, prevents um, the, these from, from aggregating. And so, uh, you, you know, the, you, you mix in, you know, uh, certain uh, chaperones with um, poly, uh, Huntington and, and other poly-Q, um, uh, proteins and you see inhibition of, of aggregation. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know what the, um, uh, how different chaperones limit or, or their capacity to, I, I guess it, it must be related to, a, to the KD is that once you have um, an association um, of the glutamines that uh, uh, is strong is for a chaperone, uh, then that's where you see rampant aggregation in, in humans. That would be my speculation as, as to why that's happening. But it, it, it's, there's a lot of chaperone activity, I think, that's going on there. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed both of your talks. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for your question. Thanks. Next is Jimmy, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, I have a question for Sam. Mm -hmm. And I really like your talk and your work is very quantitative and you prepared, uh, you, you also uh, kind of model, modeling the system. My question is, you, you mentioned you have this flanking region that pre-nucleating the, the aggregation region, the polycule region. Mm -hmm. Can this be a general thing for neurodegenerative disease? For example, for alpha-synuclein, for tau, they all have this pre, uh, this, flanking region and they seem all from oligomers. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Actually, Ron Wetzel, I don't remember the results of the paper, but Ron Wetzel uh, mixed two sequences of amyloid beta, I believe, either with polyq or with the N-terminus of, um, of Huntington and, and, and tried to answer that, that type of question. Um, but I, I, I don't you know, have a, have an answer, but presumably there is something that that stabilizes there, there some interaction that stabilizes the ol oligomer um, for any of these aggregating proteins. Um, and the the unfortunate thing is that right, and if you look at the questions here, is that you know the conditions that uh, that create this you know particular oligomer may just be unique to the conditions that we've chosen in our biophysical assays or biophysical experiments. So, you know, whether or not they're actually occurring in vivo is, is a good question, but it, it does seem that, um, you know, prevalent in, in, in many. So it's a, it is an interesting comment and, and uh, you know, a, an area that is, is, it should be studied, you know, or hopefully be studied, you know, more extensively. I, I asked this question from the disease point of view and also mm -hmm. from the kinetic point of view. It mm -hmm. kind of suggests you know, uh, the, the beta sheet aggregation need certain threshold to build up. And that threshold had, was helped by the N-terminal region yes. in our case. Sure, and yeah, that threshold seems really critical, right? Yeah, yeah, because um, you know, ultimately, like if you just look at pure plain polyglutamine sequences, they will ultimately aggregate 
um, to form beta sheet structures. Uh, but you know the those flanking sequences in in any of those those proteins do facilitate uh, aggregation or ameliorate you know or abrogate aggregation in a certain way. So the right the C terminal domain, the polyproline rich domain, um, serves to uh, slow down um, the aggregation in, in Huntington. So uh, flanking sequences certainly do play a, a very strong role um, in that. So the uh, in this case, the N terminus just by virtue of the fact that it you know very readily forms these these helical structures um, uh, facilitates aggregation for Huntington. What what interesting for uh, protein tau is the polyproline region actually uh, functions similar to the N seventeen region here. Oh, wow, that's very that is, it's curious. That's, yeah, it is curious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like we don't have more questions. So I have a couple of questions for you, Sam, and one more mm -hmm. question for Anup. Mm -hmm. uh, so like uh, for, for the uh, like the dimer to tetramer, the one that you are detecting, and if I remember correctly, it's less than 2% uh, population in your sample, right? So have so, you... Yeah, go, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so like I was wondering, like, have you ever tried to like do like kind of diffusion kind of uh, NMR experiment to actually like detect those kind of uh, uh. So there, those species are invisible in our NMR spectrum, right? So we're doing relaxation dispersion measurements on the monomer. Um, and then we're modeling those data um, with the kinetic scheme that best describes, um, or we're, we're, we're creating a kinetic model that best describes the, the, the data. Um, so diffusion measurements on those, would, you, would, you would need a, a, a more substantial and NMR peaks that are not broadened beyond, detect, beyond detection. Um, so you need probably higher population uh, of those species. And then, so, it, the, so the, the total um, amount of invisible species uh, comes to between all of the oligomers that we see, both dimers and the tetramer is about 5%. So okay. uh, the off-pathway dimer was 1% and the on-pathway dimer is about 2% and then you have about 2% tetramer. The, and the, interest, the yeah, interesting model point, that and that's at 1.2 million. So that, that's at the highest concentration we use. Is what, that's where you see um, populations. Those populations that I reference are for a concentration of 1.2 millimolar. Obviously, all of those will be lower. Um, the lower the concentration. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the interesting model that you are showing, like the anti-parallel helical, like the one that you did, like mm -hmm. the paramagnetic distance measurement. So for that sample, did you purify these like tetramers or is just like? Uh, no, no, no. So we did. Um, so what we did was we we introduced um, the a one to forty ratio of a paramagnetically tagged uh, NMR inactive species, right? So we have N fifteen labeled Huntington, and we have you know a um, you know forty fold lower uh, MTSL label. Um, and uh, then we perform PRE measurements um, between, you know, intermolecular PREs measurements between those. Okay. Levels. Yeah. So it's not order. rather we use and and actually uh, I, I thought more about Jeff's question earlier. So the the, the tetramer you wouldn't be able to use CS Rosetta or, or um, purely with with chemical shifts, I suppose to, to uh, calculate a structure. You need the distance information um, with the oligomer, unless there's something I don't know about right. S Rosetta that would uh, you know, enable you to perform that calculation without the, the distance restraints that you get from the, from the PRE measurement. So it's, yeah, it's, not, it's not purified, rather it's, it's, a, it's a structural model um, based on the knowledge that we know that the N17 region is helical, um, and the distance information that the PRE measurements provide. Okay, yeah. And so the last question. The yeah. So the last question is that, like, I know, like, the chlor group use a lot of like storage using the bacterial OEL that that is a like highly homologous uh, to the human HSP sixty. And you are mentioning about the mini chaperon for the small group. How conserved like the HSP sixty dose? 
and uh, and I was thinking like sorry you're you're breaking up you're breaking up a little for me and what is the okay. question sorry can you hear me now yeah I'm still breaking up okay so I was wondering like the mini chakram that you were mentioning like uh, from grow here how conserve is that uh, mm -hmm. mini chakram which is your HSP 60 is it like more than 70% identity or like, do you remember like how conserve uh -huh. they are yeah, the I mean the structural homology is very high. Sequence homology is I think it's about fifty percent in the mini chaperone itself. I don't know. We didn't calculate that. Um, how you know the sequence homology of the of the apical domain? Um, that off the top of my head, I, I don't know. Um, but that that is the recognition site in in Groyel. Um, so like in ge in uh, general, and, and like recognizes I, I didn't. What's that? Yeah, in general, like like when chaperone actually inhibits any kind of like this kind of like misfolded food, or like you see some kind of folding, like I think uh, Binjo earlier mentioned that I have thought of using EPCG as a model, which is more like make the protein to be misfolded state, right? Or in the initial state. So in your study, like for this mini chaperone, did you see any kind of like structural changes during this kind of like dish measurement? Have you ever so tried to? Um, so let me, it binds as a helix to the, to the uh, mini chaperone. So, um, it does stabilize the, the, the helical structure. Um, now, um, the actual interface and the orientation there, we, we didn't calculate that. So just from the chemical shifts, we know that in the bound state, it does take on a, a helical structure. So we know um, you know, where it binds on the, on the mini chaperone and, and uh, that the N-terminal sequence itself binds on the, uh, as a helix uh, to the mini chaperone, but we didn't do any measurements beyond, beyond that to you know, determine, um, you know, the specific, you know, modeling, mo we didn't model that structure. Okay, yeah, thanks. All right, so I think there is no more question. Last question for Anup. Uh, Anup, I think uh, I found like one of the interesting findings that you guys have discovered is like your pro-insulin like uh, concentrating in ER and cannot go to uh, like Golgi when especially when you have these kind of like, you know, uh, like the disulfide bonds, right? I was, I was wondering more about the Akita mutant that you are mentioning, like your seven number residue is... Right. Um, uh, uh, mutated to tyrosine right yeah so like 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 if you look at that like i think c peptide has been used as a biomarker to actually quantify how much of insulin your body is producing right so yeah is that yeah. correct yeah so so in the akita mutant so like if the pro-insulin cannot transport from the er to golgi so would we assume that there is no insulin like no c peptide in this particular mutant or how exactly the uh, like the mouse survives in that particular mutant Right. So as you saw in that picture, uh, there were three good alleles of proinsulin still intact. There is just one which is having the mutation. So that one uh, can actually uh, make use of most of the good proinsulin and hold them back. However, still uh, there are some proinsulins, good proinsulins may go forward uh, from there. Uh, and that might keep it alive for a while. But when the animal keeps developing diabetes with, with its age, it, uh, it, you will see that a drop in the insulin outside of the cell. So uh, in the younger animals, you see that more of such escape happening, but probably when that uh, interaction of the mutant has become more, uh, you know, more severe at the later stages, and uh, so less and less pro-insulin is, uh, like is being made available for making insulin probably. So that's what is happening. But uh, definitely uh, the ER quality control will not allow the aggregates to go forward. So anything little bit that may go forward are the good pro-insulin molecules that may uh, show some insulin also outside of the cell in the, uh, in the Akita model. Okay, that's good to know that there is a pro-insulin and bad insulin, which I was not aware of. Yeah, so I was yeah, thinking yeah. Like, like even the pro-insulin having the tyrosine mutation in it, like when it go to the Golgi and ultimately in the Golgi, you have the PTM, like the post-translational yeah. modification. So have you ever, have you or like anybody like tested in the past, like 
if this kind of particular mutants have some kind of problem in the endoprotease cleavage like uh, uh, do you have any kind of like uh, evidence for that that's a very good question uh, some of the mutations which uh, uh, specifically are located near to the c peptide uh, can affect that uh, cleavage thing but uh, generally the er does not er quality control does not permit the mutated or misfolded uh, molecules to move forward anyways so if at all some do escape from there those may not be bioactive even, even if they go forward and make insulin those insulin may not be bioactive because in this akita case it already misses that one disulfide bond so without the all the three disulfide bonds it cannot go and you know bind to its receptor and then uh, do the lsc the signal transaction in other cases also uh, when the, uh, the the there is a mutation in the sequence which may affect the structure then there is the bioactivity is also affected so it's less likely that first of all that these mutants can go beyond the er Uh, well, like to make this story like very simple and short. I was wondering, like in a reducing environment, let's say you have some DTT or like something like that, okay. there, and you already have your pro-insulin monomer with your tyrosine in that, and if you add some kind of endoprotease in vitro, do you see this kind of cleavage or oh, you have some problem in that? I have not done that experiment. Yeah, that's okay. I, I already had uh, uh, like this kind of suggestions one of my posters earlier in. Uh, the internal medicine symposium few years back but we have never tried doing that addition from the outside to see what happens yeah that's a interesting aspect all right thanks okay. all right then i think we we have no more question let's thank both the speakers for the outstanding job today and thanks everyone for staying so late on the weekend and joining us today we look forward to see you all in our upcoming webinar have a great weekend and i think we can end the meeting here Thank you very much guys. Thank you so much. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It was Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you.